Hi guys, my name is Charles and I'm one of the surgeons at Southpaws. Uh, today, we are going to be exploring the neck of a dog that has an abscess and the ma uh, fluid filled mass has been present for several months. Um, it was treated conservatively initially with antibiotics and um, anti-inflammatories and it appeared to improve to some degree, but over the past couple of weeks, it's been enlarging. Um, this is in a 14, 16 month old puppy, um, spaniel puppy. Um, and so the mass has not been particularly painful, but um, at some points it does seem to react a little bit when uh, the mass is manipulated. So we've done a CT scan and you can see the scan in the lower corner of your screen. And on the right hand side, you can see the mass protruding from the skin. And I can describe to you um, a little bit about what's going on there. So the white dots that we can see for the most part are blood vessels that have IV contrast in them. And I can't get to my computer right now, so I can't really point them out clearly, but pretty much all the white dots that you see around are blood vessels. There's one that's right deep to the mass, which is probably the um, jugular vein, or it might be the lingual facial vein. And that is likely going to be sacrificed during this procedure. Um, sitting underneath that lingual facial vein, just underneath the mass is the uh, mandibular salivary gland. Um, you can see the paired one on the opposite side. And for those of you that are not used to looking at a lot of CT scans, one thing that's really help helpful is looking for symmetry. So dogs are, are pretty symmetrical from left to right, except for what's going on with the heart and with the abdomen. And so if you see something different on one side than on the other, that should be a sign to you that something is abnormal. Um, and so uh, the salivary glands you can see are symmetrical. Um, we can see in the middle is the skull, and then inside the skull you can see the cerebellum. Um, you can see the three um, uh, lobes of the cerebellum uh, protruding into the bone of the skull. And then the air-filled spaces on either side um, would be the ear canals. Um, and it's possible that this abscess is associated with the ear canal. The other alternative is that we have a grass seed uh, in there somewhere. So just draping it in right now, and then we're going to go for a little hunt. I'll take the mass out in block. That's what you get when you come to a cancer surgeon with an abscess. So the alternative would be to cut into this and then, and then go searching for a foreign body. But... Um, my preference is going to be to just excise the whole thing in mass or in block um, with the idea that if there is a grass seed or something, it's going to be enclosed within that space. Looking at the CT scan, I can see that it doesn't extend down into the uh, retropharyngeal region or anything like that. And so uh, I'm not concerned about running into some scary anatomy um, when I'm dissecting. I might see jugular vein and lingual facial vein and things like that. But unlikely to get into uh, things like the vagus nerve and, and stuff like that, that I'd be pretty, you know, more concerned about damaging. So uh, as always, um, please feel free to post questions on the chat. We have a live chat going and please subscribe to our channel and send this to anybody else that you might know that might be interested in having a look. So we're just gonna do the pre-surgical checklist we're checking that the ground plate is connected on the electric artery machine, and it is. Confirming the side in procedure, so we're doing a left-sided uh, cervical explorate, uh, exploration for an abscess. The instruments we need, we're just going to use Ligasure, and uh, we'll have our um, electric artery, and then we're going to have some gelpies in here as well. Um, we don't need photographs because we're live streaming and potential complications. Nothing really during the surgery. I suppose that we could get into some, uh, some hemorrhage, although I don't think that it would be very likely and I don't think it'd be likely to be dangerous. So just palpating the mass here and I can feel the salivary gland deep to the mass right in here. The ear canal is sitting there and it seems to be mobile independent from the ear canal. Um, jugular vein is sitting right here. So if I 
hold, compress that, you can see the jugular vein very clearly in that region right there. And uh, that's pretty much it. So we'll just get our electric cautery plugged in here. Thanks, Jess. And we'll be using suction because we may have some pus that makes an appearance in the wound. Might get a, a fray, a yank our suction tip, please. All right, so, and the skin is kind of indurated, so the skin is nice and thin outside of the abscess, and then when you get over the abscess, it's kind of indurated, so I've got lots of skin extra in this area, so I think that I'm just going to excise that skin in block. Again, that's what you get for coming to a cancer surgeon with an abscess. So making an elliptical incision. Can you provide some retraction for me here? This is the wing of the atlas. I can palpate underneath my fingers here. We're uh, getting a little bit light, so we'll just have to give some fentanyl or in. You see a bit of twitching here. And that kind of mottled appearance to the sub Q and the um, the in kind of the uh, subcutis and subcuticular region is consistent with a foreign body or at least an abscess where you have that edema uh, that's going on in the skin. Can you retract on that for me, please? Thank you. Nice and vascular. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be pretty inflamed in this area, so it's going to enhance the blood supply. And so these are all just cutaneous little bleeders. I would almost not attempt this if I didn't have electric cautery. I could cope without ligature, but um, electric artery, I would be whining. You'd run out of hemostats pretty quickly. Yeah. So that's the wing of the atlas right there underneath. It gets me a little bit oriented. Come around the other side. Can you guys please confirm that you can hear the audio, incidentally? I can see the meter going up and down on the computer screen, but I just want to confirm that you can hear me because there's radio silence right now. I don't hear anybody making any comments or questions. Usually I get lots of them straight from the beginning. So it couldn't possibly be that my content is dull. Definitely not. Uh, can I get number four, Gelpies, please? There is a question. Uh, what is the mass that we're exploring? OK, so the question is, um, what's the mass we're exploring? And this is a puppy, so 16-month-old puppy that has a cervical abscess. It's been present for several months. Um, and it's responded intermittently to antibiotic therapy. Um, it has been variably painful, maybe just a little bit sore. Um, and so we did an aspirin on it and got frank pus. So I'm assuming that there's going to be a grass seed or something in here. I don't think dogs really get abscesses very often if there's not a foreign body uh, in there. And so I'm always concerned that there's something underlying that caused the abscess to develop. Let's get our gilpies. So I'm just going to come up here. Gee, and these big gilpies may not be big enough.
All right. And the audio. Great. So I'm really hoping for a grass seed in here because they're fun and it's good for the dog. I think we were live streaming the last time we found the grass seed in our yeah. abscess. I reckon you found that grass seed, Jeff. Mm, it was down and around the heat canal as well. Yeah. All right, so jugular vein is just sitting right here. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, Kind of the light, I think the light is so bright from your view that it might be hard to see the shadow and the shape of the jugular vein. There's a question as to whether we saw the foreign body on the CT scan. So that's a really good question. We often get asked that, can we see the foreign body on the CT scan? And generally the answer to that is no. Wood uh, or, or biological material like a grass seed does not um, distinguish itself um, as far as contrast is concerned from uh, from the surrounding soft tissue. If you had a metal foreign body, like I had a, one dog that had a stingray barb um, embedded in the re uh, retropharyngeal region, and that showed up beautifully um, on the CT because it was calcified. But other than that, often we can't see anything. Sometimes we can see the wooden skewers. Yep, wooden skewers. Sometimes we can see we've had a run of a few of them. Uh, so kebab sticks that dogs eat because they're yummy. So I'm down to jugular vein sitting right here. And if I puncture that jugular vein, um, that really wouldn't concern me very much. I would just ligate it. I'd rather ligate it before I puncture it. But if I inadvertently puncture it, I'm not going to panic. Jess, can you just take that off um, So I'm down to platysma muscle here. And I am going to have to sacrifice that jugular vein. It's going right through the center of this thing. Again, that doesn't bother me at all. Hopefully it won't bother the dog. Um, so the question that our student Laura is asking is if you can find the entrance tract and often they come in from the oral cavity. Um, this dog had a funny um, abnormality to the tonsil and so it's possible that um, a grass seed got stuck in the tonsil or crypt and then has just exited in this region. Can I get some silk please? And I, I usually use silk to ligate big vessels. And the reason why I do that um, is because of my history and training in cardiac surgery. We use silk a lot because it has really good um, handling characteristics, great knot security. Um, and look, are there better things that you could use properly? Probably, but... Um, um, I've always, I, you know, haven't had a problem to my knowledge and that's what I like to use. So, so I'm just going around the jugular vein here. So we'll under that, please. We'll grab another silk.
of you are watching from Canada. Hello, Canada. We don't get a lot from Canada. I don't know if it's the time zone difference. Just get my Metsies in here. So we're transecting the jugular vein there. Thank you. And that means that I'm going to have to ligate its brother on the other side. Or sister. Don't mean to be mm -hmm. sexist. It's 2019 after all. So there's the salivary gland sitting deep to that. So that's mandibular salivary gland sitting right there. And I'm not going to remove that because I don't think that it's involved. What sort of issues well, could we run into if we were to traumatize the salivary gland? We talked about this in the consult a little bit about potential for salivary mucosal. Um, so I'm ligating the lingua facial vein, sorry, the maxillary vein here. Hold on to that. Grab another piece of silk. Now, a trick that I use when I've got a vessel that's engorged with blood like that is that I'll do my loop on my suture and then I'll drag it up. It's not going to work as well here. And then when you ligate it, you've emptied the blood from the lumen, which means that when you cut it, it's not going to make a mess. in regards to the location of the incision and the orientation. Someone's come a little late. Uh, so this is the mandibular salivary gland. That's rostral. That's caudal. So mandibular salivary gland is sitting there. We've just ligated the jugular vein, which was here, maxillary vein, which is there, and then the lingua facial vein will be down here eventually. And I'm not excising the mandibular salivary gland because I don't believe that that's involved here. That's a maybe a bit of parotid salivary gland. Let me have that back there. So somewhere in here should be my lingua facial vein. If it's not, I need to go back and learn my anatomy. Maybe sitting right there. There it is. Phew. We're worried. Let me show through that little guy. Uh, same thing, salivary mucosal, sialocele, mucus, uh, salivary mucosal is all the same all thing. The same. Yeah. So that's my lingua facial vein sitting right there. Silk, please. Just pull that caudally for me.
Hold on to that for me, please. And I do my same little trick with the blood that's within the lumen. So I pull my knot down and then pull it back like that and then tie it. And you can see that I've completely emptied the lumen of blood. Thank you. All righty. So I'll just come through here. All right, so that's out, and I'm just going to review my anatomy here. So that's masseter muscle sitting up there over the ramus of the mandible. I can palpate my temporal mandibular joint up here. That's the mandibular salivary gland. The digastricus muscle is going to be sitting right in here, and that's what we have to pass the salivary gland over in order to get to the sublingual region, which is down here. Uh, atlas, the wing of the atlas is sitting there again maxillary vein, lingofacial vein, jugular vein back here. So now, while I start closing this, we'll get Jeff to cut open the abscess. Um, actually, I might get you on the back table. Um, you can start dissecting through that, Jeff. Can I get some 2 PDS, please? There's a question about, uh, was the facial vein uh, branch cut and will that affect the dog, dog school? So the question was, was the facial vein cut? Um, it was, so that would be the lingual facial at that point. Um, so the lingual facial vein was sacrificed along with the maxillary and the jugular, and it won't cause any problem at all. Dogs have so much uh, collateral and redundant circulation that you can, there are very few veins in the dog that you can't cut. Um, So I've got Jeff working on the abscess over here. Hopefully we'll find a big grass seed and when we find it, or if we find it, I'll bring it back into view so you can see what's going on. A piece of one. Okay, right, so we've got a grass seed sitting there. I don't know if you guys can see that. Can you move that into the field a little bit more? There we go, so that's a grass seed sitting there. That's exciting. Just what we were looking for. And look, is it possible that we could have found it just by doing a local incision rather than excision? Yes, it is. But I have found, especially in areas where I'm not too concerned about um, critical anatomy, I would rather just take it out and block. And that has worked um, very successful, successfully for me in the past. And I'm sure that um, by not taking that approach, you could inadvertently miss some foreign bodies and leave them in place. I'm going to just show the inside of that abscess. Jeff. So that's the inside of the abscess and the grass seed would have been sitting right in the middle of that. And we don't need to submit that for histopathology, um, although we have already submitted a culture. Be careful not to pick off my maxillary vein. I'm just taking all this time and effort to make sure that I'm not losing a lot of blood so you guys won't judge me. It would be embarrassing to damage the veins on the closure. Question about whether you'll be placing a drain. Uh, so question about whether I'm placing a drain. This is a completely dry field. Um, we've gotten rid of the abscess. We've gotten rid of the... Uh, foreign body, and so I will not be placing a drain on these. It is it is an unusual situation when I put a drain in anything, um, and certainly not Penrose drains. If I'm going to use a drain, I'm going to use something closed suction. Penrose drains are basically ineffective at providing drainage. All they do is um, create a foreign body response, and you might get a false sense that you're going to develop a lot of fluid production because you put the drain in, when in fact it's because the drain is in there is why they're producing all that fluid. So the old chicken or the egg. So I'm just doing some little interrupted sutures here. 
get everything generally in place, and then we'll do a intradermal. There's also a question about if we cut any nerves in this area. Um, so question is if we cut any nerves in this area, and really there are no nerves that we're concerned about. You're going to run into some spinal accessory nerves and that sort of thing. If you go to the base of the ear canal, you could run into the facial nerve. If you were right up against the trachea, you could run into the recurrent laryngeal nerve and maybe the vagus nerve. But if we're superficial out here and certainly superficial to the salivary gland, you're not going to run into any important nerves at all. We have some more suture jelly. Maybe some 3 0 monosin. Happy with that for the rest of the closure. Okay. Yeah. I've got a sub segmental mandibulectomy in a dog later on today um, that I will try to live stream, but it depends on what surgery suite my nurses put me in. All right. So Jeff is going to take over and complete my closure here. Um, and so I'm going to scrub out, and um, I will be on the chat for a little bit. I can answer any questions that you might have. Um, uh, question is, are you faced with the one-time use of our Ligature device? And the answer to that is we are faced with it, but luckily we have ethylene oxide sterilization here. And so... Um, we can reuse them. We probably get about five to eight uses out of them, something like that. Um, if you guys have Ligasure and you want to reuse them, it's likely that you'd have a human hospital nearby that would be happy to turn instruments over for you like Ligasure. Um, and you can either ethylene oxide them or you can plasma gas sterilize them. I suppose in a pinch you could even uh, Cydex them, which is a liquid sterilization that's commonly used for endoscopy. It's just that if you're using Cydex, you have to make sure that you rinse it really well uh, before you put it in the patient. Uh, now, um, any other questions? I am going to turn off the audio now and let um, Jeff continue to close in peace, and I will continue to man manage or man the chat for a few minutes. Please subscribe to our channel and please feel free to send this to anybody else that you think might be interested. Thanks for watching and hopefully we'll have some more surgeries this afternoon.